Look, I, I think it's rather difficult to answer that mm. at this stage. Uh, but uh, what we could say is that I think the impact's going to be profound. Uh, of course, a lot of people are concerned about the question of authorship or creators. Mm. You know, who, yeah. I don't see that as such a big problem, frankly, you know, because we have always had some assistance in inventorship. So uh, I don't, it, it is just another example of a computer assisted invention. Somewhere there is a human being, it's a question of tracing and going back. Um, but uh, the big question is. Do, does the existing intellectual property system, for which the categories were really developed in the Industrial Revolution, does it provide the right set of incentives for the sorts of technologies that are involved in artificial intelligence? So does the patent system serve correctly in these new, ca new technologies? AI is data and algorithms. Yeah. And this, you know, uh, do we have the right sets of rules and principles governing the use of data? Certain strong traditions out there, for example, open data, open science, open publications, and they're very serious traditions, you know, they're not, they're not um, trivial. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, competition depends at a certain stage on closure, I think. So I think one of the major, major issues uh, coming uh, in respect of artificial intelligence, but really the whole digital economy, is where you draw the lines between openness and closure. And I think that as soon as competition starts, that's when you can start to draw the lines. So pre-competitive activity um, more likely should be open. But, you know, that also is covering research uh, and there are, you know, companies are going to be very sensitive about this, the extent to which the data. Think of the biomedical sciences, mm. the ma massive amounts of data in computational biology. You know, they may not want that data out there. Um, and uh, uh, so this, I think, is really something we don't fully understand yet. Uh, we need to do a lot more consultation you know, with the relevant scientific and industrial communities and business communities before we can decide on, you know, where you draw the lines of closure. Some people would not like not to draw any lines of closure, but I don't think that's realistic. The United States, the current United States administration has said so, uh, that it would uh, prefer to make rules outside the multilateral system. It doesn't want to make rules multilaterally, it wants to do it bilaterally or um, in, in other ways. Uh, so this is an enormous change, of course, huge change. Now that's going to place us in a position, I think, where um, we will have different groups making rules in respect of a subject matter that is highly mobile and inherently international, you know, data on the internet. Mm. Um, and uh, um, that will mean, I think, that the first mover, provided it has the scale, will be making the rule for the world. And a good example of that is the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. So the EU has made a, a regulation and by virtue of the scale of the EU, the size of the market, basically the whole world has to comply. But we don't really want a competition in regulatory. So it may not be long before China makes a rule. So I think, you know, we come back to the age-old problem of, well, you have to have an international approach to these things. Uh, but the international approach is unlikely to be as it was in the past, namely, you know, the existing multilateral system. Uh, at the moment, it's going more towards rapport de force, you know, strength of position, power. Uh, but uh, the, our history for the last 70 years has been trying to make rules rather than settle things by power. Artificial intelligence generated music. 
uh, if you have complete openness, can I take the whole repertoire of Sony Music and feed it into an algorithm? You know, or is there some closure point whereby I can't take a copyrighted work mm -hmm. and feed it into an algorithm? So another question is deep fakes. Uh, you can make a highly realistic video clip or film of a public figure making uh, a speech or a pronouncement that they've never made uh, that might be perceived to be racist or, you know, uh, belligerent or whatever uh, havoc that that could create on social media. I personally don't think it's going to affect the central task of the granting of intellectual property rights. So uh, I think that that is an activity of the state that states are not going to renounce. Uh, and I don't see blockchain af affecting that. However, I think blockchain will have a big influence on licensing. Mm -hmm. So um, blockchain, I think, will uh, assist in creating integrity and traceability. Um, I think the biggest challenge is probably complexity. Uh, so we have um, an increasingly complex architecture for intellectual property. You know, you have activity at the national level, at the bilateral level, plurilateral or regional, like uh, the EU, and international. So that's quite complex architecture and it's very different from, uh, from tw 20 years ago or 30 years ago when we had national, international more or less. Uh, and then I think you couple with that the fact that this complex world moves extremely quickly. Our institutions are made for a different speed. I was rather uh, surprised positively that the pattern system has been used so much. But the classical system is, is somehow seems to be working. And let's remember that one of the great advantages of the classical system was transparency. You get technology disclosed. Transparency and the possibility of people to use it. Uh, I would like to um, remain involved, but not necessarily in a public manner. I would very much like not to be bound by an alarm clock.